Hello everyone, Sky here, and you do remember that the sky is infinite, right? So, it's time for us to make a higher jump again, and find ourselves in the part of the sky where aviation turns into astronautics. And the hero of our journey will be one of the main modern heavy space carriers, and the rocket that is in fact the main transport of the modern Russian space industry. The story of one of the symbols of peaceful space exploration and international cooperation ironically begins in not-so-peaceful times. The beginning of the 20th century was a time of great change. One of the main breakthroughs was the active development of a new branch of physics, atomic. And none of the boring nerds of that time, who are now considered to be the greatest scientists of the century, didn't know if they were opening the way to the great future, or was it the Pandora's box standing before them. The next couple of decades proved that it was rather a Pandora's box, and the first practical implementation of the new physical principles was very vivid and is now known to us as an atomic bomb. But science was far from its limits. Scientists considered a more ambitious nuclear weapons design. The idea was an attempt to start a nuclear fusion reaction, with a release of tremendous amounts of energy, like in the stars, including our sun. The advantage of the new scheme is that unlike the atomic bomb, limited in power, the power of this device is limited only by the conscience of its creators. At first, the number of designs for such devices was huge, and they were so complex that the implementation seemed too difficult and expensive. Various simplified designs were created, such as the American George and the Soviet Sloika bombs, which had limitations. However, over time, as a result of a large-scale research, a solution was found. The teller ulam two-stage scheme assumed that the main energy emission would be caused by the fusion fuel, and the small atomic bomb would be a detonator, since a lot of energy was needed to start the fusion reaction. The scheme was effective. Tests of the Ivy Mike and the RDS-37 devices in the early 1950s confirmed their terrible potential. Thus was born the hydrogen bomb. Over time, these bombs were becoming more and more powerful, and their designs more efficient. The apogee of this race was, of course, the two most powerful man-made explosions in the history of mankind. The 15-megaton Castle Bravo explosion and the 58-megaton AN-602 explosion, better known as the Tsar Bomb. These devices were so powerful that the first atomic bombs in comparison to them seemed like fireworks for kids. They could give their masters an opportunity to inflict absolutely terrible damage to opponents using a small number of carriers. But they had a drawback. Hydrogen bombs were quite large and heavy. The Tsar bomb, with its enormous power, was 8 meters or 26 feet long, and 2.1 meters or over 6 feet in diameter. It weighed over 26 tons, over 58,000 pounds. In fact, it was so massive that the rather large 295 bomber had to be decently modified to carry it, and at the same time, the bomb was still put on an external suspension under the fuselage. The question arose of creating carriers for such weapons. Heavy hydrogen bombs were to become the new weapons of the nuclear triad. The devices had to be adapted to existing and future strategic bombers. It was proposed to launch a new type of submarines and torpedoes, the explosion of which would destroy coastal regions. And of course, thermonuclear warheads were to become the tips of the main arrows in the arsenal, ballistic missiles. But it was clear that the existing missiles, including the main Soviet rocket, R-7, would not handle such a heavy load. It was proposed to create new, heavier rockets, or to use the initially civilian ones. For example, the proposed N-1 moon rocket was considered as a potential carrier for the heavy hydrogen warhead with a power several times greater than that of the Tsai bomb. Of course, it didn't go that far, and the N-1 rocket never saw space, but the work was started and continued. Karolyov, Yangel, and of course Chilamei design bureaus offered their projects. Moreover, the OKB-52, under the leadership of Vladimir Chilamei, made the most interesting proposal, to create a whole family of different carriers at once. They were called Universal Rockets, with the corresponding indexes UR. The light UR-100, the medium UR-200, the heavy UR-500, and the super heavy UR-700. These rockets had to be deeply unified. The heavier ones were technically the assembly of the lighter ones, which not only simplified the development and operation, but also significantly reduced the cost of production. It was possible to make many different models from the same elements. 
Eventually, in 1961, Chilamay's project was recognized as the most promising, and was given a task of creating the UR-200, and after some time, the UR-500. The UR-500 was very important, since it was the heavy rocket that was to become the strategic carrier of the 150 megaton hydrogen bomb. The family principle of the rockets was carried out to the maximum. Initially, the first two stages of the rocket were in fact the four parallel connected two-stage UR-200s, and the second stage of the fifth UR-200 played the role of the third stage of the UR-500. That's a lot of nuance. The picture turned out to be complicated. There were too many extra elements that significantly reduced the payload mass. The design was changed, unified with the UR-200, but not so radical. The rocket was designed in accordance with the standard processes of its construction and operation. It had to be produced at a factory and then delivered in disassembled form for the final assembly and launch to Baikonur, which has forever become the only launch pad for the rocket. The dimensions of the stages of course were adapted to the requirements of transportation. The route from Moscow to Kazakhstan is pretty long and the trains have limits for the cargo size. Already at the design stage, despite the obvious military focus, the rocket had the potential for civilian use built in. With its performance, it promised to become an excellent carrier and to be used not only to set up the global nuclear apocalypse. One of the features, and in our time perhaps the main problem of the UR-500, was its power plant. The RD-253 liquid propellant rocket engines were once unique and revolutionary. They were created in the early 1960s, initially for the Soviet Moon program, but Sergei Korolev didn't want to use them because of their ecological problem. The engines used unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide as fuel. Due to this fuel, the engines and rockets were simpler than their oxygen kerosene counterparts, but this couple was also extremely toxic. They were not used on the N1, but for the military UR-500 such engines were quite handy. Simple, reliable, powerful, not environmentally friendly, but let's be honest. When you have a 150 megaton hydrogen bomb as your payload, the environmentally friendly fuel no longer seems so critical. The decision on the potential civilian use was very fortunate and in fact saved the project. In the mid-1960s, the idea of massive use of ultra-powerful hydrogen bombs started to lose fans, and the creation of carriers for them, including aviation, naval and missile, was recognized as too complex. The UR-500 risked becoming useless, besides the military abandoned the UR-200 in favor of the R-9 ICBM. However, the Model 500 performance could be effectively used in civilian space, and it began to transform from a heavy ballistic missile into a heavy launch rocket. In the winter of 1964, Baikonur started preparations for the first test launch, which was carried out on May 15. By the end of that year, the military line of work was closed. The first space payload was launched by the new civilian rocket in 1965. It was the Proton-1 research satellite, the first representative of four such vehicles launched by the UR-500 rockets over the next few years. The name turned out to be contagious. Over time, everyone started calling the rocket Proton. So, despite the initial three-stage plan, the basic Proton had two stages. The second stage was in fact the legacy of the unborn UR-200, but the first had to be created from scratch. It is composed of a central unit and six side units. In the large central block, there is oxidizer and compartment for equipment, while the side ones contain fuel and engines, 6 RD-253. Despite the appearance of the main unit and boosters, the first stage has a monolith design, quite elegant by the way, but the side blocks do not separate from it in flight. The second stage is equipped with four engines, three RD-0210 and one RD-0211, which provides pressure for the tanks. The section of the transition compartment is open and looks like a grid for venting gases, since the separation of the stages is carried out according to the HOT principle, which means that the engines of the second stage are started before the separation of the first. The basic UR-500 was a medium-lift launch vehicle, capable of launching loads of up to 8.4 tons or 18.5 thousand pounds into the low Earth orbit. If this seems modest to you, yes, the creators of the rocket thought so too. The creation of a more complex three-stage version, the UR-500K or Proton-K, began almost immediately after the start of the basic version launches. 
This rocket was supposed to be able to take loads on trajectories flying away from Earth, capable of reaching the moon. It was 1965. The grey ball was at the top of all charts. The engineer's fantasy did not stop there. The work was underway to create the most complex version of the Proton, a 4 stage one, to which Block D was added, technically a modified version of the 5th stage of the giant N1 rocket. This rocket, in theory, was capable of sending a special version of the Soyuz spacecraft to fly around the moon in an unmanned and manned versions. However, these ambitions didn't find realization. The lunar version of the Proton was too complex and its trials had many setbacks. The launches of the N1 giants were not crowned with success either. And when the moon got trampled by the Americans, the interest in it considerably dropped. The projects were cancelled. Nevertheless, the Proton-K rocket continued implementation in both the 3-stage and the 4-stage versions. It inherited the first stage of the basic Proton, but with the replacement of engines to the RD-275, the more powerful version of the 253rd. Great changes were made on the second stage, the tasks of which became more complicated. Its tanks were enlarged, making the stage longer and giving it the form familiar now. The third stage was completely new. It is technically a modification of the second, but shortened and equipped with one RD-0212 engine, a special version of the RD-0210 from the second stage. This engine has a rather interesting design. It is technically a double-engine system, which includes the main single-chamber engine and a four-chamber steering thruster. The whole set is designed to work in outer space. In the most complex version, Proton-K is equipped with the fourth stage, an accelerating upper section, initially the block D and later its modifications. This block is located inside the fairing, connected on the bottom to the third stage and on the top to the fairing of the payload. This unit is used to more accurately launch vehicles into the higher orbit. The rocket reached space for the first time in 1967, and despite many difficulties, accidents and delays, it nevertheless entered the service, although not very soon, in 1978, after more than 60 launches. Over time, the Proton was upgraded and showed itself very well in work, launching into space military, scientific and civilian vehicles, including very heavy ones, sometimes into geostationary orbit. The choice between three and four stages allowed varying the performance for special tasks. The rocket exceeded the basic version several times, having the ability to place loads of up to 21 tons into the low Earth orbit and up to 2.6 tons into geostationary orbit. Proton-K made the first step in the construction of the International Space Station. It was this rocket that in 1998 launched into space the functional cargo block Zarya, the very first module of the ISS. In fact, it was the Proton-K that was the main Soviet and then Russian heavy launch vehicle up to the beginning of the 21st century. Since 2001, it started being replaced by its heir, the carrier rocket Proton-M. The new version on the outside is difficult to distinguish from its predecessor, but it was significantly revised in terms of filling. First of all, Proton-M received a new control system that allowed more efficient steering in flight. And this means not only more accurate maneuvering, but also efficient fuel consumption, reducing the territory of potential fall of use stages and better environmental friendliness. The giant rocket sections falling from the sky in random locations, with hydrazine propellant leaking out of them, is not the greenest technology in the world. In addition, Proton M was given an opportunity to expand the number of options of its fairing. The Protons always had a lot of them. They are all 4.35 meters in diameter, but their length varies from 10 to as much as 15.25 meters, depending on the payload. And yes, this mattress on the rocket is not a part of the fairing. It is a special thermostatic cover that provides the right environment to often very demanding spacecraft. On the launch pad, the cover gets removed. Another bonus was the new Bronze M upper stage, which was more efficient in inserting the load to a specified orbit. The power performance has also improved due to the installation of the modernized RD-276 or 275M engines. The thrust of six of those monsters reached the mark of just over 10,000 kilonewtons. By the beginning of the 2010s, the M version completely replaced the version K. In 2012, the Proton K was launched for the last time. The operations of the most popular modification, launched 310 times, were completed. 
Now, at least in 2019, Proton-M is the main and in general the only heavy class launch vehicle operated by Roscosmos. With a length of slightly more than 58 meters and starting mass of 705 tons, it is capable of launching 23.7 tons or 52,000 pounds of load into the low Earth orbit and up to 3.3 tons 7, pounds, into the geostationary. The rocket is constantly being upgraded, both to improve the performance and to increase reliability. Since 1967, more than 400 launches of all versions were carried out, 49 of which were unsuccessful, so they do not claim to be the most reliable in history. The most difficult was the initial period of operation, when accidents were happening due to many beginners' problems. But in recent years, accidents have also occurred with the rockets, causing significant public resonance. The crisis events are rolling over the Proton with no mercy. In the early 2010s it was assumed that the rocket would soon be replaced by new generation carriers, but the Angara family, in particular the A5 heavy version, is being late, so the work on the launches remains with the Protons. In parallel, there were plans to create a family of Protons, with light, medium and heavy modifications. But then it was announced that over the next few years, the operations of Protons would be completed in favor of Angara. Again, it is a question of timing of implementation of the Angara program. In order to put aside the old rocket, it is first necessary to start the new one on the series launches. The Proton Heavy Carrier rocket never became the main Soviet nuclear hammer, instead turning into the main Soviet Heavy Space Transport. It did not participate in manned programs, but became a tool through which hundreds of civilian and scientific programs were carried out spacecraft flying to other planets, stations, communication satellites, and many other complexes were launched by the Protons. The era of this carrier is coming to an end, but the history of conquering the infinite space will remember Proton forever. Let's hope that its heirs are worthy of the ancestor. That's all for today. Fast flights, soft landings, blue sky, and bright stars to you.